us as we study this, your inspired and inerrant and authoritative and sufficient word. Might the Spirit of God use the word of God in the hearts of the child of God as you would show us our sin that we are to be slaying. Thank you that we're not only united to Christ as we've already learned about in Romans, but now we've got this resource, not of a, uh, some new program, but a person, the indwelling Holy Spirit of God that compels our obedience, that indwells us and shepherds us in His path. Help us to be being filled by Your Spirit on a day-to-day basis and grow in that endeavor for Your praise and glory. We pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, beloved, take your Bibles and join me in Romans 8, if you would. I'd like to continue to preach to you about life in the Spirit. This would be our third message from Romans 8, where in these two pregnant verses of verses 12 and 13, Paul's going to instruct us how we are obligated to mercy alone. There is an obligation in the Christian life. We are, after all, delighted debtors, debtors to mercy. We've already sung about our debt to Christ. And we're finding that there is joy in Christian duty. Duty is not a dirty word to the believer. Friends, London Baptist preacher Spurgeon reminds us, quote, we fear not God because of any compulsion. Our faith is no fetter. Our profession is no bondage. We are not dragged to holiness nor driven to our duty. No, our piety is our pleasure. Our hope is our happiness. Our duty is our delight, unquote. What I think Spurgeon was driving at is that for Christians who have been bought at such a high price by the blood of Christ, there is no price too high to pay in rendering obedience to our Lord who loved us first. He went all the way to Golgotha's cross in His obedience, and we, according to Hebrews, have not resisted to bloodshed striving against our sin. No, we... We don't perform in order to merit God's favor, but every bit of our service and worship and sanctified slaying of indwelling sin is a response of loving obedience. After all, we are delighted debtors to grace. We're obligated to mercy alone. Hallelujah, that we are no longer in bondage to sin, no obligated to do its will, and yet are obligated to kill indwelling sin through the power of the indwelling spirit. I think that we need to make an important clarification at the outset. The part of man's spiritual DNA, so to speak, is a desire to perform. It's innate in us. To try to merit God's favor through good works, to earn our way, We see it in the phrase, I did it my way, and it extends so much in our our practice that if, if something's given, we don't want to be outdone, and so we feel like we must reciprocate it so that we owe no man anything. Prideful self-confidence does not want to accept a free gift. That is, unless they have some entitlement attitude and are the leech of Proverbs who says, give, give, Proverbs 30, verse 15. It's hard to conceive of gift, that which is not worked for. It's hard to conceive of grace. This is why Isaiah the prophet says that in in regards to the gospel that we buy without money, it's already been purchased for us. We come with empty hands, and then as we receive the gift of God's salvation, those hands that have been empty are filled with gospel ministry out of hearts of gratitude. 
We, are, we want always to strive to guard the gospel of God's free grace. That's why I said that I thought we had to begin with this clarification. We want to keep the gospel pure and untarnished and untangled from works. We preach time and again that salvation is a gift of grace alone received by faith alone. And yet, there's a sense in which the gospel, as we say, is a command to be obeyed. Wait a minute, I thought it's a gift to be received. It is. But you can also call the gospel a command to be obeyed. Jesus came to town preaching, and in the very first chapter of the gospel of Mark, what's Jesus' message? Repent and believe. So if the gospel is a command to be obeyed, that means that there are those who disobey it. When the Apostle Paul, who wrote the letter of Romans that we're studying right now, wrote to the believers at Thessalonica, and he he talks, he kind of fast forwards to the end times where God is going to be dealing out retribution to those who do not know God. And those that don't know God, he says, are those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They haven't obeyed the gospel. Later on in our study in Romans, when we get to chapter 10 and verse number 9, Paul's going to tell us that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. That's a command, not an option. Must confess Jesus as Savior and Lord. So there is what we could say is an ought to the gospel, but it's not a human work. It's divinely derived. We all get saved thinking that we'd done something. After all, we did what the evangelist told us to do, whether that be the preacher or the family member that preached the gospel to us. After all, I did repent of my sin and place my faith in Christ. And then as you start to percolate on those truths and you read your Bible, you study it and you understand more of the gospel, we've learned that we really didn't do anything. Out of the starting gate of the book of Romans, We learned that we do not have the righteousness that God requires for entrance into His heaven, and we certainly did not seek after God, though we might pat ourselves on the back and pride ourselves that we did. Once we've obeyed the gospel, we are told that we have been saved unto good deeds, that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians chapter 2. So get your efforts sanctified and infused by the Holy Spirit on the right side of the equation. We are saved to serve. Before Christ, any of our service does not merit God's favor. So what motivates those good works? Christian duty. Performance? Not at all. The day God set His love upon you, from that point on, you cannot be more loved by God. How often do you think about that? Were you not to serve Him and honor Him and obey Him, you would be just as loved even though you you will serve and obey Him. So it's not a performance mentality. This is so different. Paul had started talking in Romans 8 about this new mindset that we have as the redeemed. So God's already set His love upon us, can never be more loved by Him. You have it in all of its fullness that He gave on Calvary. Now remember uh, an account in the Gospel of Luke. You remember with this woman who was known as a sinner. 
like she's the dregs of society, and she came to worship her Lord. She anoints him with perfume. She's a sinner. And right after she anoints him, as all the Jewish hypocrites were looking with disgust that Jesus would allow such a sinner to touch him, Jesus tells the parable of the debtors. The parable of the debtors. And he does explain that her sins, which are many, which we sang about in our song service, her sins, which are many, have been forgiven, and she loved much. He teaches them that day that he who's forgiven little loves little. Now, let's not misunderstand that. When you are forgiven of your sin debt through faith in Christ, you're not ever forgiven a little. But maybe our understanding is really minuscule. And as we meditate on these truths that we study throughout our Christian experience, we learn to understand, yeah, we were introduced to us being sinners and depraved, but I didn't realize I was totally depraved, as bad a wretch as I was. That's what Jesus was teaching. When we realize that we've been forgiven much, what is the response? We love much. So great a debt, who could repay? We couldn't. But all of our service and worship is motivated by what He's already poured into our lives. So there is an ought to the mercy of salvation, an obligation, a debt, a delightful duty. That needs to be part of our theology that we preach to ourselves every day, that I am not working to perform to make God smile upon me, but He loved me so much in His forgiveness, how could I not obey and put sinful practices aside. So it needs to be part of our theology, part of our repertoire in which we admonish one another on these truths. Paul understood this theology of duty. In the very first chapter of Romans, he had said in chapter 1 and verse 14 that I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. He could not help but preach the gospel. That's what motivated him. That's why he didn't give up. The good news has to be shared. It needs to be proclaimed from the housetops. When Paul writes to the saints at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse number 16, For if I preach the gospel, I've got nothing to boast of. I'm under compulsion, for woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. For if I do this voluntarily, I have a reward, but if against my will, I have a stewardship entrusted to me. What then is my reward? That when I preach the gospel, I may offer the gospel without charge so as not to make full use of my right in the gospel. You know, as Paul would go out and he'd share the gospel, people would be gloriously saved, Paul, you've given up so much. Thank you. It's like, I didn't do anything. I'm just under compulsion. I'm stewarding in faithfulness. Woe is me if I don't preach the gospel. That's why later on, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 9, he says, I've been made a slave to all. Folks, this is kingdom talk. Kingdom talk that takes the gospel and salvation serious. That's why we're not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God unto salvation. It's all in, baby. Or to quote Spurgeon again, when he exhorted people, don't be, a, don't be half a Christian, and you shall have enough religion to make you miserable. Be wholly a Christian, and your joy shall be full. So friends, be all in. Be all in. 
Romans 8, look at verse 12 if you would. So then, brethren, we're not under obligation, or excuse me, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you are living according to the flesh, you must die, but if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Friends, I want to propose to you that we are obligated to kill sin through the Holy Spirit. That's the point of the text. Kill sin through the Holy Spirit because we are delighted debtors. It's our joyful Christian duty. And you see that in the very first two words of verse 12. So then, this is Paul's famous favorite therefore. Paul reminds his readers of the magnificent privileges of victory over sin that they now have with life in the Spirit. The first 11 verses of the chapter unpack for us, there's no condemnation, either you're according to the flesh or according to the Spirit. Either you're an unbeliever or a believer, just two categories of people on planet Earth, no third category. So point one of our messages is just a review of the doctrine before we get to the doing. We could preach a whole sermon on those two words, so then. But don't have a panic attack, we're not going to do that, okay? From the opening words of the book, we read that there's none righteous. We read that we lack what God requires for entrance into His kingdom and that we can do nothing about that status. Paul tells us in chapter 3, verse 23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, a condition, a status they can do nothing about. Were God not to invade with His amazing grace. And then in his very next verse, Verse 24 of chapter 3, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption in Christ Jesus. This is the saving righteousness of God. What we could not, God did for us. That righteousness that He requires to gain access to His kingdom that we lack, not only did He provide it, He provided it through Himself. He did it all. Being justified as a gift of His grace. Sovereign grace initiative of God. So that is, he continues his message. And he takes us to our spiritual family of Adam in chapter 5, how that the last Adam triumphed over Adam's sin, the triumph of grace over the power of sin, chapter 6, over the power of law, chapter 7. So there's a sense in which the entire study thus far has been working out the so then of verse number 12. In chapter 8, we made a point two weeks ago as we got into it that the Holy Spirit takes center, cha- center stage as the indwelling enabler of the Christian life. You just study Galatians 5 sometime to see what your flesh can accomplish and all the works therein that we looked at last week or the week before. I don't remember which. Compared to when the Spirit invades a life and draws us to faith in Christ and now produces fruit of that born-again experience, fruit of regeneration, love, joy, peace, patience, and you read that list in Galatians 5 as well. What a difference the Holy Spirit makes. You know, He's, uh, as we think about in this text, that He empowers us for victory over the flesh, we are obligated to live according to the Spirit. After all, He's united us to Christ. He's given us a new nature. He's assured us of a new destiny. We're no longer under God's condemnation. We are set free from the law of sin and and death. 
We're no longer under the dominion of sin, but now walk by the Spirit. These are what God has done for us that we could not do for ourselves. So how do we respond to it all? Do we, in our entitlement attitude, just take it for granted? Or do we truly live for Him and fight against the sin that's so offensive to Him that took our Savior to the cross? Maybe we could put it this way. Every biblical exhortation, every command of Scripture, the imperatives is based on the blessings and the promises we've already received from the Lord, the indicative reality of being in Christ. As we said before, we'll say it again, the imperatives given to the believer are tied into the indicative reality of being in Christ. If we used Ephesians to illustrate it, Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is where in rapid fire This is what your walk is to consist of, and do this, don't do that. Well, it's not just behavior modification. It's not dry drudgery and duty, but it's tied into the first three chapters of those that are in Christ. We've got all the spiritual blessings in heaven. We've got Trinitarian salvation. Father's plan sends the Son and leaves the Spirit so that when we preach the gospel, He draws sinners to faith in Christ. It's all of Him and for Him and to Him is the resounding refrain of Ephesians 1. So you've got to tie your imperatives into the indicative realities of being in Christ. Since verses 5 to 11 of our chapter has made clear that every genuine Christian is indwelt by the Spirit and that his or her life won't be characterized by worldly, fleshly concerns and activities, the emphasis now is the believer's responsibility, being in the Spirit, in our obligation. We're indebted to be in an all-out mission to eliminate and eradicate sin out of love for Him who bought us. So when he starts off, so then, what's he been teaching us? The doctrine, because that is the duty of our practice thereafter, our obligation. I've got a pastoral friend that's getting ready to go off on a three-month sabbatical due to his gracious church, and he'd stacked up a book, a bunch of books that he can't wait to read when he doesn't have all this work to do. And uh, he's going to study pastoral theology, and he's, he reached out and said, hey, what am I forgetting? I don't care if it's a new book on pastoral theology you've read or something I need to be reminded of. I said, brother, don't forget the Reformed Pastor by Richard Baxter. In his pastorally theology way, he says, take heed to yourselves lest you live in those sins which you preach against in others, and lest you be guilty of that which daily you condemn. Will you make it your work to magnify God, and when you have done, dishonor Him as much as others? Will you proclaim Christ's governing power, and yet condemn it and rebel yourselves? Will you preach His laws and willfully break them? If sin be evil... Why do you live in it? If it be not, why you dissuade men from it? If it be dangerous, how dare you venture on it? If it be not, why do you tell men so? If God's threatenings be true, why do you not fear them? If they be false, why do you needlessly trouble men with them and put them into such frights without a cause? Do you know the judgment of God that they who commit such things are worthy of death? And yet, Pastor, will you do it? Thou that teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery or be drunk or covetous, art thou such thyself? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law dishonorest thy God? What? Shall the same tongue speak evil that speaks against evil? 
Shall those lips censure and slander and backbite your neighbor that cry down these and the like things and others? Take heed to yourselves, lest you cry down sin and yet do not overcome it. Lest while you seek to bring it down in others, you bow to it and become its slave yourselves. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same is he brought into bondage. To whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants ye are, to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. O oh, brethren, it's easier to chide at sin than to overcome it. Many a tailor goes in rags that maketh costly clothes for others, and many a cook scarcely licks his fingers when he hath dressed for others the most costly dishes. I learned this week of a well-known evangelical leader who just stepped down after 48 years of pastoral ministry. For, and it's due to sin is the phrase that's used and hasn't unpacked what the specific sins are. You know, as a fellow pastor and preacher, I'm fearful of growing passive in the fight against sin and desirous to never have that double standard that the same word I preach to others that it will sanctify them has not sanctified me. The Apostle Paul calls for an all-out war on fleshly sins that remain in the life of the believer. He sets forth the action, the application. Obedience is the hallmark of the Spirit. As he starts verse 12 off with, so then, verses 12 to 17 is the doing. You know, the law of God is something to be done. It's something to be obeyed, not just deliberated. And we can't deny what we believe. Doctrine is for doing. So point two of the message, since we're not going to spend a whole sermon on so then. What is the exhortation on the doing? It's God's pattern for victory over the flesh. These two verses are the application of what he's taught us previously. The doctor, Lloyd-Jones, suggests that they may be the most important statement on the practice of the New Testament doctrine of sanctification in all the Scriptures. Verses 12 and 13 of Romans 8. This is very practical application in practice, how the believer wages war against sin. Friends, we can't go back once we've come to Christ. We can't go back to the world. The past is dead to us. If we try, we frustrate the process and live without joy and victory. So to unpack this exhortation on the doing... Letter A in your outline in the back of the bulletin. Believers, brothers and sisters, are not debtors to live according to the flesh. Verse 12. Paul reaches out to the brethren. Adelphoi. Fellow members, brothers and sisters. Fellow saints, in other words. These, this exhortation, verses 12 to 13 is not for the ain'ts, but the saints. It's for believers alone. Those that have been united to Christ, who are now indwelt by the Spirit. And I think we ought to footnote here, strictly speaking, these verses are not exhortation in that you don't find them in the, in the form of command. We're really going to see the commands when we get to chapter 12 and following. But it's implied exhortation. Though he gives us indicative statements of reality and our status as the justified of God, this ought, this obligation, this duty is what ought to be true of us. And he begins stating it negatively, what it looks like negatively. He says, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. So there's that word again, obligation. 
Maybe your translation reads debtors. It speaks of somebody who is liable. It can be used in the New Testament uh, in a monetary sense, such as in Matthew 18, 24, where this person owed a whole lot of money, and it speaks of the repayment, this obligation to repay. It can be used in a moral or social sense, like in uh, chapter 15 of Romans, and verse number 27, yes, they were pleased to do so, and they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. So there's our term again, indebted. And what Paul says here by the negative is that we are not indebted any longer to the tyranny of the flesh. When we were unbelievers, all we could do was sin. We had no power to not sin. Its mastery in everyday life has been broken. Though we will still commit sins, we're now going to own it through biblical confession and repentance. We're going to seek the Lord's cleansing and forgiveness Because that sin that we used to practice, when we go back to do it again, we wake up in the middle of the night and I hate myself. (laughs) I need my spiritual bar of ivory soap, 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So our sins now are broken with repentance. We are no longer obligated to follow the flesh. We saw in verses 5 to 11 that there's only two classes, those of the flesh, those of the spirit, unbelievers and believers. And there's a radical difference due to the ministry of the indwelling spirit. Why do we get convicted when we sin as a believer? The indwelling spirit, that not so silent voice at times, the silent shepherd that opens his lips and puts his heavy finger of conviction on our heart as he brings to mind the scriptures that we have violated. So the flesh does not exercise dominion over us. Paul's thoughts here are very similar to what we learned back in chapter 6. Flip back a couple of pages to chapter 6 and verse 1. Because it's been a a week or two, a hot minute since we uh, were in chapter 6, right? Romans 6, what should we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into His death? Question. When we introduced Paul's talk of baptism here. We weren't talking about believer's baptism. This is not wet baptism. This is the baptism of the Spirit, though it's not till chapter 8 that Paul really starts unpacking the ministry of the Spirit. So we are baptized into Christ by the Spirit. Verse 4 of chapter 6, therefore, We've been buried with Him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. So what's our identity as believers? We are identified in Christ's death and raised to newness of life. Knowing this, our old self was crucified with Him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. For he who has died is free from sin." Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over Him. For the death that He died, He died to sin once for all, but the life that He lives, He lives to God. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Consider yourselves. This is a 
theological reality. Remind yourself of the doctrine of your death and resurrection in Christ. You're united with Him and indwelt by the Spirit. So this is the fact that's true of all believers. We are spiritual. We're in the Spirit and dead to sin, no longer obligated to obey that old sin nature that was killed. We're not debtors. Paul doesn't finish his thought here. You know, are, are you back to our text here? So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, dot, dot, dot. You know, I, um, I feel like I'm in good company here with Paul because he doesn't finish his thought. Squirrel, anyone? Do you see that? We're expecting him to finish his thought. He says, we are debtors not to the flesh, and we expect him to fill in the rest of the thought that we are debtors to him. It's a provocative absence. But we don't find the words anywhere. I think it was helpful, as Tom Schreiner, New Testament scholar, noted, the language of obligation and repayment doesn't accord with the Pauline intention. So how come Paul didn't finish the thought there? Because we spent a little time in the sermon developing that we are works-oriented, we are performance-based, and we, we cannot read the obligation, the duty of the Christian the way that performance does. That's why when we think of obligation or we think of Christian duty, it's a delightful duty. It's not... Um, it's not a drudgery to serve the Lord, is it? It's a delight. Well, since Paul doesn't finish his thought here, neither can we. We just move on to the next verse. Second thought he gives us here is that living according to the flesh brings eternal death, as if he needs to remind us. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. So again, we still evaluate our lives. Am I in Christ? What characterizes my life, flesh or spirit? A sinful manner of life results in death. Paul is not saying that the believer, if he's a true believer, can lose his salvation and face eternal death. But he surely can enjoy his present eternal life if he lives like he's in death. If he seeks to live as a non-believer, he surely won't enjoy the indwelling presence of the Spirit who will now convict him and show him his guilt for trespassing his Father's law. You think of where elsewhere Paul has talked about grieving or quenching the Spirit, activating his convicting ministry in our heart of hearts. Let's get real practical. Christians like to speculate and venture into questions of how much can a true believer sin since it's a fact that he can never reach a plateau of sinless perfection. How much? How deep? Can he sin? How frequent can he sin? And how long can he persist in his fleshly ways before God takes him out? We're not going to turn there. We're not going to discuss it. It's not the point of the sermon today. But maybe you ought to jot down 1 John 5, 16 and 17, the sin leading to death. Because the Apostle John, in this difficult passage talks about a sin that leads to the believer's death. Probably not a specific sin, but whatever in the tolerance of God, he's had enough. 
God's taken his child to the woodshed time and time again. Finally, he takes him out, takes him home to glory before he does too much more devastating glory on his testimony or the name of Christ. Recall, uh, uh, maybe it was last week, we were in 1 Corinthians 3, Scripture unpacked in Scripture that uh, Paul talks to the Corinthians how that a believer can still be fleshly. Christians can get very carnal. They just don't remain there. Think about the possibility of physical death, chastening for the child of God. That he'll take you out before doing too much damage to the name of Christ. Think about the Corinthians who fell asleep. In other words, they died at the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 11. Think about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts 5. Again, this is not loss of salvation. But definitely no assurance of salvation because your assurance has been sacrificed in your disobedience. Assurance of salvation, is that a right or a gift? It's a gift given to those that are walking uprightly before their Lord. When we persist in our sin, we're on again, off again. Am I Christian? Am I a false convert? No, just... (laughs) When a believer is disobedient, not showing the works of the Spirit, it's going to seem like the unsaved. Don't mess with it. Don't get lost in the, the, the debate and the speculation of how much can I sin and be a true believer and how deep and how frequent. Stay as far away from the cliff lest you fall over. Don't trifle with sin. If you live like a non-Christian, dominated by sinful self rather than living according to the Holy Spirit, you'll perish like a non-Christian. That's Paul's point. Radical action through the indwelling spirit. We're not an obligation to the flesh. We no longer have to obey it. And if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Third point, those who put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Holy Spirit live eternally. You know, this is Paul's first instruction of what believers are to do in this fight against sin that they no longer live in, like they did before they came to Christ. What do they do? They mortify fleshly deeds and desires and hack it to pieces. I think uh, one of those booklets in the book nook on hacking Agag to pieces gets into that talk. The king was disobedient to the Lord when he says, go and utterly destroy all. And so Saul says, yeah, I did that. The prophet comes to town. He said, then what do I hear? The bleeding of the sheep. Well, I kept that for sacrifice for the Lord. He's disobedient. He's rationalized his disobedience. And so the prophet had to do what the king was told to do and hack Agag to pieces. Serious, ugly sin illustrated in Hacking Agag to Pieces. I think that book gets into some of that. So when we mortify, we put to death fleshly deeds and desires, why do we have to make such a big deal of it? Because there's so much bad teaching. There's, There's false views. Let me just give you two of them. There is perfectionistic teaching where believers are seeking some kind of experience. And usually it's a wrong idea of the baptism of the Spirit. That if they can reach that plateau of the second blessing, then they'll get to that plateau where sin is entirely removed. And we'd mentioned it already in the wrong view of getting out of the struggle of Romans 7 and getting into the spirit of Romans 8, as if the Spirit's going to do what we're told to do. Dear friends, sin is with us for life, and we cannot get rid of the struggle of Romans 7, nor can we stop the fight within. It is war on with the flesh until Jesus either comes for His church or calls us home. Perfectionistic teaching will not get you there. Second of all, 
Let's just call this second false view a pilgrim's guide to rest. And matter of fact, there's a bad book by that same title. Where all you've got to do as a believer is believe the correct message. Just rest in the gospel, what he's accomplished, and he will obtain the victory for us. All we've got to do is abide and rest and not wrestle. Now, there's a right way of resting in the gospel. The gospel primer, which is also in the book nook, um, is about the believer preaching the gospel to himself. Like, uh, we're, we're believing the gospel. I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm, I'm a saint. My identity's in, in heaven for eternity. I've mentioned that there's no imperative here for this exhortation that's implied. But there are in other parallel passages when we read and reminded ourselves today, Romans 6, 1 to 11, when Paul did command and he said, so consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. You died to your sin as a Christian. Consider. But you need to follow up that doctrine with the doing. I think uh, Colossians is... Instructive here for us, if you join me over there, Colossians 3, because he merges these two thoughts together of our identity, dying with Christ, and yet our command to put to death remaining sin. It's a both and, not an either or. Colossians 3, look at verse 5 if you would. Colossians 3, 5, therefore, or so then... Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which amounts to idolatry. For it's because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self. God placed us in Himself. Old man died, never to live again. And yet we are commanded that when He tries peeking up over the wall in our lives, I'm alive, I'm alive. No, you're dead. Consider yourself to be dead and follow that up with the action where you slay those individual sins, put them to death. Beloved, we need to get our theology straight for our practice to be straight. French theologian Calvin said, when it's a question of our justification, we have to put away all things about the law and our works to embrace the mercy of God alone and to turn our eyes away from ourselves and, and upon Jesus Christ alone. Amen and amen. Justification, however, is not sanctification, even though the two doctrines are connected at the hip. It's only the justified of God that can be progressively sanctified and grow into the image of Christ in desire and deed. Our eyes are still on Christ, but they are energized by the Holy Spirit so that we can obey His law. There's a whole law-gospel distinction in covenant hermeneutics, which is troubling that we can't get into today. And here's why that law-gospel distinction in covenant hermeneutics doesn't work, is because you can't find... Uh, there. Sometimes you find commands and the indicative reality, but other things are just the greatness of God. Which column are you going to put those in? It just doesn't apply to all of Scripture. Let me illustrate it this way with a simple, practical, real-world example. Suppose a Christian who's tempted to look at sinful things online and pretend you're allowed to talk to him in the, the moment of struggle. Do you say to that brother, flee sexual immorality? Are you crazy? Run away? 
God tells you to, and He wants to do, wants you to do what is best, so run. That's the imperative. You're like Joseph. Put on your Nike shoes. Get out of town away from the temptation. Or do you say, Brother Bob, you need to recognize that you're unable to flee from sexual immorality, so instead, think about what Jesus did for you. He fled from sexual immorality perfectly, and your failure to do so is placed on Him. Now through faith in His Spirit, uh, now through faith His Spirit dwells with you, and so your contentment is in Christ, and thus acting on your temptation would show a lack of appreciation for and a lack of contemplation of the substitutionary death of Jesus. Think about it. Just think about it. Where's the war? Where's the mortification? Where's the call to action? Totally missing. So the believer's once for all death to sin does not free him or her in any way from the necessity of mortifying sin in his members. It makes it necessary. It makes it possible for him to do so. While being led of the Spirit in obedient life of following is verses 4 and following, which we're not getting into today. Let me give you just a sampling of what is here in our text. When he generally says, put to death the deeds of your body, well, what deeds? Well, you read, we read some of those laundry list of sins in Colossians 3. Every time you read in the Word, is there a prohibition commanded? Is there something to include? So who did it? The Spirit or me? Or like the pop quiz I've asked you before, who lives your Christian life, you or God? All you do is nod your head. Philippians 2.12 What's commanded to the believer? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Verse 13, for it's God which works in you to will and to do. So, I'm called to action and the Spirit's already acting. Divine co-op of progressive sanctification. The end of the day, we own and confess our sin and every positive traction towards godliness, we thank the Lord for His enabling grace in our spirit-infused obedience, because we haven't been left to ourselves. He uses our obedience to the simple commands of Scripture to accomplish that sanctification. When Paul says to the saints at Ephesus in Ephesians 5 and verse number 18, And do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. There's the command. Be being filled. That doesn't just mean get up in the morning and have your devotions. That means be being filled throughout the day. It doesn't mean when we close our Bibles and get into work. Be being filled. lots of truths that Paul writes to Ephesus, he writes to the church at Colossae. And so the parallel of being filled with the Spirit in his words to the Colossians, Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. So to be filled with the Spirit is to be filled with the Word because the Spirit without the Word is silent. They work together. These are the only resources God's given us to live the Christian life, His Spirit and the Scriptures. So we take them to battle against indwelling sin. When Peter enters into the picture 
First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 11. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. And if our fleshly lusts are going to wage war with us, what are we called to action to do? Mortify them. Called to war. Fleshly lusts personified by Peter as if they're an army of rebels or guerrillas who incessantly search out and try to destroy Christians' joy, peace, and usefulness. And if we engage, surely enough, there goes the peace, there goes the joy, there goes the usefulness. So we're obligated to kill sin through the Spirit. As we live each day and every day, however many the Lord gives us, throughout the dailiness of life, to live it in the power and control of the Spirit. The beloved Apostle Paul, in harmony with the other apostles, quite clearly teach that the way of sanctification is in realizing the truth about ourselves as Christians and then putting into practice under control of the Spirit. It's simple, the hard work's in the doing. Friend, you owe the flesh nothing. You owe the one who redeemed you everything. So do not pay flesh allegiance. Do not show any subservience to it. You do not belong to it now. Our obligation is to someone else. Hymn writer Philip Doddridge helps us to see it when he says, My gracious Lord, I owe, I own thy right to every service I can pay and call it my supreme delight to hear thy dictates and obey. So we're not debtors to the flesh. But there is one to whom we are debtors. Top Lady uses the same argument. A debtor to mercy alone of covenant mercy I sing. This is where, beloved, we are debtors. Not to the flesh. We're finished with the flesh. Debtor to mercy, of lo- mercy alone. Did we not sing this morning, O to grace, how great a debtor? Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. So we've got no obligation to the flesh, no claim upon us. We're not interested in it. Served it too long, but we are going to pay our debt. We're going to show our gratitude. We're going to honor our obligation. So our passage began with a negative. Each Christian refusing to follow the inclinations and desires of residual sin in life. Deny its efforts to impose its lifestyle on you. These desires of body are incredibly strong, so strong the best language Paul could use of overcoming them is putting to death. That's aggressive. Brethren, you need to Summon and harness your will to overcome sin, squelching the sinful impulses as you yield to the Spirit's control, petitioning and begging Him for divine aid. And I'll tell you why I put it in those terms, petitioning and begging Him. I was working with a counselee years ago, and I asked him if he was desperate, desperate enough to put on his prayer list and beg God for victory and for help. And he responded that that was quite beneath him. Full of self, not humbly sold out to the Lord in the Lord's glory. Friend, are you willing to take radical action and recognize the weakness of the flesh and the need of grace and help of the Spirit? Because victory is by means of the Spirit. We conquer sinful passions by relying on and trusting in the Spirit to provide strength. Every resource given. No temptation has taken you, but just as common to man, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Every resource through the Scriptures and the Spirit. As we wage war with the sword of the Spirit, slaying fleshly lies with life-giving truth. Whether those lies be the sinful flesh within or the wicked world system without, Might we respond with the old Puritan, John Bunyan, 
It reminds us that when a person becomes a Christian, it's no longer a priority to listen to the world. It's no longer a priority to care what the world may think because everything changed. The world looks completely different. All the temporal pleasures of this world becomes less enjoyable because a greater joy has been found in Christ. Thus, you place your fingers in your ears. You no longer care what the world, about the world's opinions. And you run like a lunatic crying, life, life, eternal life. And so, beloved, with fingers in your ears, might you cry out as you leave this place of worship today, life, life. Life as we wage against indwelling sin. Father, seal your words to our hearts. Thank you that you have taken every step needed to bring sinful man to the cross of Christ. We know that you won't do anything you've commanded us to do, but you join us in that battle as we wage war against indwelling sin. Thank you for your spirit who energizes our obedience Change our hearts so it's a delightful duty, not a drudgery. Might we manifest our love for Jesus as we slay sin and pursue righteousness for your praise and glory. We pray in your name. Amen.